Three, two, one, and we are live. I'm Indy Nidell. And I'm Spartacus Olson. And I'm Ian Souden. And this is the first regular episode of the Time Ghost podcast. Time Ghost is our company that makes documentary series, historical, real-time, and chronological documentaries, which you mostly see at Time Ghost History or World War II in real time. And our podcast here will be broadcast as a video on our new YouTube channel, Time Ghost Podcast. But it will also be available to listen to on all the regular podcast platforms like iTunes, Spotify, RSS feeds, what have you. And what sort of stuff, Sparty, can they expect to see and hear here? Well, Indy, we're historians, so it's going to be a lot of history. Uh, But there's also going to be a little bit of interesting stuff from our lives and what goes on around us, and how that impacts the historical, or how the current times are impacted by the history they belong to. And, And when we go off on completely unintelligible and meaningless tangents, who is going to put the brakes on us? It's going to be me over here, Ian Souden. I'm going to be the voice of you, the patron community, the Time Ghost community, and all of your lovely questions that you've left for me throughout the entire week. I will be asking them to Indian Sparty. And this is important. When this goes out live, it goes out live to our our patrons. Um, And if you have questions that you want to ask us, to be answered during this or beforehand, you can join the Time Ghost Army at patreon.com or timeghost.tv, and that will happen. And now, Ian, take it away. Okay, well, the first topic that we have over here to discuss, and we've been getting a lot of kind of questions about this under our YouTube videos, under our YouTube comments, is that Elon Musk has decided, or seems to be deciding, that he wants to purchase Twitter. Now, that's obviously going to be a pretty big acquisition, We're here in the YouTube space, in the tech space, on public platforms and kind of public media platforms. And a lot of people in our comment sections are saying that they want Elon Musk to buy YouTube next. A lot of people are saying that it's a bad thing for free speech, a good thing for free speech. I mean, Sparty India, is there any kind of historical precedent for what we're seeing here? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of historical precedent. I think one of the most interesting things is actually one of the discussions that's also ongoing, not just because Musk decided to acquire Twitter, but in general, when it comes to how society should deal with these platforms, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and whatnot. Um, If we go back about um, 130 years in time, we'll see that there were other companies that were also private companies that were founded in order to bring electricity, for instance. Uh, water, uh, all of these things. And they were originally private companies and they became public utilities. Um, at some point, we decided as societies that it's too important for us to have these things and to leave them up to private interest. So there were a lot of instances where all of those were broken up. And when we're talking about media, the Edison Trust comes to mind. Uh, at the end of the 19th century, Edison had started acquiring any patent he could that had to do with filmmaking, Uh, especially he acquired all of the Marconi patents and a lot of other things, the uh, Latham Loop. Um, And that put him in a position to actually corner the whole cinema market and to control it to a point of where if you were going to the movies in America, you were going to an Edison show, and he decided more or less what was going to be there, even if the producers were arguably independent. And that was broken up. Now, wait, um, hang on. We talked about that in season one of, uh, no, in in season, was it in season one or season two of Between Two Wars when we did an episode? Oh, we actually talked about it in in both, in both, because it's a huge thing. And I mean, yeah. yeah. And and I think, uh, Well, even from my, 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 sorry. No, go on, Indy. Even from when I was a kid, you know, when the Bell Network was broken up and I guess 73 or 74, I think 73. I remember in Houston, we had Southwestern Bell because, yeah, um, yeah, the, the uh, putting all of that in one private person, like electricity, like the whole film industry. Um, well, you know, it's a, 
It's a world of competition. I'm very interested to see what happens with Elon Musk. You know what? He, you know what he's like. He's like um, he's like like the the, the William Randolph Hearst of 2022. You know. Yeah, he is a bit, and I mean that's what that is what is a little bit worrying about the whole thing because uh, this is going in the opposite direction. I mean, uh, with all of these other public utilities, um, you know, it is important for us to be able to get our information independent, but it's also important for the press. And today, the press is anybody who has a phone in their hand. It's important for us to get out there and. While I might agree with uh, some of the free speech ideas that Elon Musk has, this current situation forces us to trust Elon Musk to want to serve the interest of everyone. And you can't be really sure of that. I mean, I think you've seen, you've, you've talked a lot about that in the past, didn't you, about William Randall first and what happened when he took over, well, most of the press in the United States for a while. But even, even be, you know, even before that, in like the 1890s, when you had um, the, the sensationalist war, I guess I'll call it, well, for lack of anything better, between Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer. Pulitzer has a great reputation today, of course, as the Pulitzer Prize, but um, the, uh, the, the journal in the world, Hearst's journal and Pulitzer's world, they were trying to out-sensationalize and out-hype each other about uh, after the Cuban Revolution, the menace that Spain was, and oh my gosh, we need to help the poor Cubans, and blah, blah, blah. And many, well, it's called yellow journalism because of a, 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 a there was a cartoon called The Yellow Kid that was in Pulitzer's paper and was poached, was taken, got more money by, uh, by Hearst. But the rise of yellow journalism and the rise of that the sensationalist press, and they really were having a war to see who could hype the most, and they blatantly invented many stories. And while people do blame them for the Spanish-American War, I think that's false. Sparty, I don't know if we've talked about this ever before. Um, do you have an opinion on the matter, or should I go into the actual Well, no, I, I, I do... I, I agree with you there, Andy, but I mean, what's interesting is specifically when we're talking about Hearst is how he started off claiming that he was serving the public interest. I'm giving them the news they want to have and all of the different things he said. And as things progressed, it changed because not only was he getting involved in the war with Pulitzer, but he also started using his own press in order to forward his political interests and running for office. He didn't succeed doing it, but that's what he did with it. And that's exactly the danger when one person controls all of the utilities. And that's, you know, and I don't know, I don't know how much you can really say that the media ever creates a war, but they definitely insert a lot of uncertainty into it. And, you know, well, he believed that he had created the war to the point that there's his quote, you know, you give me the photos, I'll give you the war. Or you give me the pictures, I'll give you the war. I mean, he believed himself to be an actual war maker. Now, there were very obvious other reasons for America, for the United States going to war in the Spanish-American War. I mean, Cuba was a major business hub and all business was disrupted by the la, 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 la. Don't need to get into that here. That's your homework, is looking up the Spanish-American War. Interestingly enough, though, one unintended consequence of William Randolph Hearst's ambitions is, of course, Citizen Kane. Yeah. <laughs> well, definitely. And I mean, we are seeing something like this going on in Russia right now, where it's not a question of private interests uh, just controlling the media, but Putin has completely taken control of media there. And we see the dangers of it. So, I mean, you know, concentration to one single person or a group of people is always a dangerous thing. I mean, that's my, my viewpoint about it. All right. Yeah. Well, I mean, Ian, you know, are you going to put the brakes on? I'm going to put the brakes on. Well, actually I'm going to, I'm going to pump the gas pedal a little bit because I've got a few questions for you guys exactly about Ukraine. That's a pretty decent segue there. You know, for Putin, there seems to be another kind of unintended consequence. We just talked about unintended consequences of his invasion right now of Ukraine. And that's that we're seeing a lot more unity of defense in the West. We're seeing unity of defense in, you know, the EU, Finland and Sweden are now trying to join NATO. So Sparty, Indy, is there a parallel to what happened in World War II and what we're seeing here in this kind of uniting? I think the, the real parallel is actually in the lead up to this. Like after the Great War, 
Many people still hoped that it had been the war to end all wars. But there were also many who believed that war was a solution for problems they had or problems especially they imagined they had. Yeah, yeah. I mean, across the world, there was a there was a sort of a struggle between those who wanted more freedom and progress and those who felt aggrieved and, you know, they dreamt of an imaginary good old days or a utopian future for their group, but at the cost of others. And they were the ones who enabled the tyrants and tyrannical regimes who began the Second World War. So, yeah. Yeah, and, and the, the countries who had sought peace, or, or maybe not just peace, but, but a status quo, were woefully unprepared to deal with that war. And to avoid that war, they tried to appease the tyrants and trade with them and find common ground. But just like today with Putin, that failed. And when war did come, unity was created by, well, by opposition. I mean, you know, remember that the USSR was an aggressor at the beginning of the Second World War, but found unity with the other aggressed nations once they too were attacked. Yeah, I mean, definitely. And some of the preconditions that led to that conflict and, and great tragedy are, are in place once again. And, and that is concerning. Yeah, but, but guys, you know, I'm hearing you talk about this right now, and we're getting so many questions about it, too. I mean, you know, we're historians. We make historiography. It's often said that historians should stay impartial, unbiased. And yet you guys have taken a stand on Ukraine. You have to. How do you square that circle? Yeah, wait, wait, wait. Wait, 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 wait. That's not true. Because it's not just Ukraine. We oppose all forms of aggression, regardless of who the aggressor is or where it is. If it's Syria or Iraq or Sudan or, or Ukraine. Yeah, sure. And, but, but I mean, one thing is really important to see here. Uh, this is the first time since we began doing historiography on, on uh, social media that a conflict of this magnitude breaks out. Uh, all the other ones you just mentioned were before our time, so to say. It's also the first time in 60 years that the major nuclear powers start edging towards a direct confrontation. And... Sorry, I hope I'm not interrupting, but I was going to say, in a situation like that, we're not just historians, we're, we're human beings, right? To not feel sympathy with people suffering and dying is callous. To not express that sympathy and oppose suffering is even more so. It, it, it makes you a fellow traveler to atrocities, and I know that sounds dramatic, but it is atrocities that are happening in, in Ukraine. I mean, killing civilians is murder, right? Yeah, and I mean, that's definitely, I mean, that's something that I think, you know, most people can or should be able to relate to the, that we don't want to see that. But for us, it's also a question of that we are citizens of democracies and, and we depend to do our job. We depend on the freedoms and rights that entails. And to some degree, you know, you have to see it as our civic duty to stand up against any force trying to destroy democracy. And after all, it's also our mission to learn, not just because of the interest. I mean, what we do is it's, it's interesting just to learn for the sake of learning. But we want it so that people can, you know, help build a better future by, by learning from the past mistakes and successes of our ancestors. So while we do say unbiased in our reporting. We don't favor this side or that, this country or that ideology. We are firm believers in universal human rights and the values of democracy, which, if you think about it, are shared values, values of the shared values of both the mainstream left and the right in any democratic country. All right. Well, I mean, uh, oh, hang on there. Got my audio up. Yeah, well, I want to kind of throw in two questions from a community, and they're a little bit, you know, linked here. Um, the first is coming from... Okay, well, hang on a second. I'm going to say one thing. That little bit right there, when this goes out, right, we're going to cut that. And, you know, the for you who are watching this on Patreon right now, you get the warts and all. Basically, you get the show and you get the backstage experience at the same time. Wow. Okay, Carry on, Ian. Okay, well, we've got a couple questions from that very Patreon community that's watching live right now. Uh, one is coming in here from uh -huh. Robert Jarman. And being still staying on the topic of Russia, I mean, how capable would Russia actually be at nuking the world? 
you know, and he asks, they have many missiles on paper, but their immense corruption means many would be degrading husks and stripped for parts. Uh, you know, throughout history, there's always been the question of will they or won't they when it comes to nuclear war. And it's something that keeps people up at night. I mean, could it actually happen? Do they have a capability? Well, you got to remember, um, you know, if let's say I'm, I have a nation and I want to launch a regular conventional war against another nation, I need more than one soldier or more than one gun. It only takes one <laughs> nuclear weapon to launch a nuclear war. If all of their nuclear weapons are degraded or they launch a bunch of missiles and all of them get shot down except for one, then the world has changed in a way it has, we've never, I mean, we've seen two nuclear, that's all we ever had was two used in war. And yeah, you can and see I, how I that changed the world. I yeah, I, I agree with you completely, Indy. And I, actually, I don't think that the technological issue is the biggest problem here. I mean, there, there's a there's a real danger when you go to war. When you let the dogs of war slip, uh, you can't really, you know, follow what's going to happen next. We saw that very clearly during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And for those of you who don't know, we made a four, 15 part series focusing on the 13 really hot days of the Cuban Missile Crisis with some um, prologues and, and looks at what led into it. But during that crisis, it came close really, really many times. I mean, it was like four or five times that, that people were close to the trigger on it. And the scary bit with that is that neither the U.S. nor Russia, or nor the Soviet Union, sorry, nor the Soviet Union wanted a nuclear war. They definitely didn't, because nuclear war is death for everyone. So they just didn't want to do that. But once they had started this conflict, there were guys on the ground who got the wrong information, did the wrong thing. And at the end of the day, it was single individuals who, who chose to do the right thing when they could have done the wrong thing. I think what stands out the most is Vasily Arkhipov, who you've talked a lot about in the show. In I was going to say him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, and I mean Vasily Arkhipov. He was um, he was the commander of the subway fleet. <laughs> Sorry, can you take it, Andy? <coughs> no, I'm just I'm just letting them get some warts and all. <laughs> Vasily Arkhipov was on a submarine that had been, was had lost contact with the Soviets, and it was he who um, who prevented. Uh, actually, he was the inferior. He prevented his superior from pushing the button, launching a, a nuclear weapon. One person prevented. Yeah. And I mean, they had uh, that war. was not that was not a missile with launch code or anything like that. That was a <coughs> tactical. That was a tactical. Nuke. Yeah, but even that's enough. Like what you'll see if you if you watch that series, you'll see that there were because um Kennedy, President John Kennedy, secretly recorded the meetings of XCOM, who was deciding what to do in all of this. And we have we were the first documentary that got to use finally the declassified that declassified recording. And there's bits when there's people talking about, well, this scenario would involve nuking Cuba and just destroying Cuba. Um, can we all live with that? And some people were like, yeah, okay, sure. You know? <laughs> oh, it's um... <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, at the end of the day, it was, it was single individuals who decided not to do it as well. So what I'm trying to drive at is that I don't think that the question is, is Russia technically capable of launching a nuclear war. They definitely are. Hopefully, there are enough men and women in command that will refuse to carry out that order if Putin should give the order. And I mean, I'll just give you my personal opinion. I have no doubt that he would be capable of giving such an order. But I, I think there's a good chance that other people will be wiser or too afraid of the consequences. Our right. consequences. Yeah, you know, unintended consequence seems to be a, a type of theme of this episode now that I think about it, you know? <laughs> okay. It's funny how what that... What do you got for us, Ian? Well, I've got another question coming in from Robert. A uh, little bit of a change of track here, but keeping on the topic of war, which war had, in your opinion, the most underappreciated impact on the modern world? Uh, can I... Let me start this. Um, I have a book... Uh, called What If. It's a big book. And what it is, is a bunch of different historians, um, they, they talk about what, how, not what might have happened had some event 
or historical event gone another way or not happened, but consequences of it happening or not happening. And William McNeil, brilliant historian, um, he actually writes the very first one, which <laughs> this is a good one, okay? Um, he even starts with it. Uh, he, he, he starts the chapter saying about military events often have unintended consequences that can happen for, for, uh, for, not, for hundreds and hundreds of years. In this case, it's a couple thousands of years. Um, okay, here's what happened, right? In the year 701, uh, Sennacherib, the king of the Assyrians, uh, attacked uh, Judah, King Hezekiah of the Jews living in Judah, the, king, the little kingdom there, and some sort of plague or illness or whatever, which is mentioned in the Bible and stuff, but you know we have the history outside of the Bible, well, we're BC, prevented them right? from taking in, that city. Are we in BC? What? Right? 701 BC. Did I not say that? I don't think you did. <laughs> I okay, was going to go like, BC. where was there Muhammad? There were not a whole lot of Assyrians not a whole lot of Assyrians in 701 AD. They went the way of the dinosaur. They were destroyed by a meteor. That's what happened to the Assyrians. I, I'm not sure you're right happened, about that, Indy, but let's, let's, let's stick okay. with that story. Well, I don't know my Assyrian <laughs> history so well, but I do know this. Okay, in 701, they failed to take Judah. Now, this was no big deal. The Assyrian kingdom, it was a big thing. There was a, the, the, uh, the Egyptians and the, the, peop the Jews were all fighting against them, and they just bypassed that one walled city and took a bunch of other walled cities. No big deal, right? Here's the thing, though. Um, now, because they did not take that city, uh, king Hezekiah remained king of the Jews, and the Temple of Solomon remained the temple, temple of Solomon, and people still worship Yahweh there, right? They did have to pay a hefty tribute to the Assyrians, sure. Now, fast forward 115 years later to Nebuchadnezzar, and he takes and destroys uh, uh, Judah, right? The kingdom of Judah, Jerusalem, uh, the capital of the kingdom of Judah. And the people are, the temple is destroyed and the people go to Babylon in the Babylonian captivity. Something happened in that 115 years though, and it happened specifically because of him not taking the city in 701. Now, uh, uh, the kingdom of Israel was destroyed 20 years before 701. And the Jews that were taken into captivity, they did not remain Jews. They adopted the other religions of their captors, and they assimilated into the new society. What happened, what you see happening with after 701, because of that failure in that 115 years, the religion became, to those Jewish people living in, in Jerusalem, no longer tied to the Temple of Solomon, and it was no longer just their local religion. Remember, if you had your local, your local god or gods, mostly gods, and someone came in and destroyed you, it was either your God punishing you or their gods were just better than your God. But in that 115 years, the temple became something that you could take with yourself because obviously this omnipotent God, had Yahweh, had spared Jerusalem from the Assyrians who took everything else. So during the Babylonian captivity, they did not assimilate into Babylonian culture. They did not take the Babylonian religion they kept Judaism as their, they kept their temple as their self. You could pray wherever you were. You were not tied to, your religion was not tied to your locale. And this is important because had Sennacherib taken Jerusalem in 701 BC, it very likely would have been the same as the destruction of the kingdom of Israel. Though who are the, the lost tribes? The, the, you know, the, and they would have assimilated and there would have been no more Jews, which means there would be no Christians, which means there would be no Muslims. And if you think our world without any Jews, Christians, or Muslims might be a little bit different than it has been the last couple of thousand years, then you are very right. Uh, and I tend to agree with him that that might be the most important and underappreciated war of all time. What do you say? Well, I mean, I, yeah, <laughs> it's interesting that you, yeah. you you bring that up because, I mean, at the end of the day, when that history was written down, there wasn't a great understanding for unintended consequences because, as you said, we we're talking about the will of God or 
prophet this or prophet that had prophesied that this was going to happen. But if we cut forward to the end of the uh, 18th century, we got people like John Locke and um, Descartes and others who are starting to, you know, during Enlightenment, we're starting to look at how we understand our world in a different way. And one of the things that was central to that, it was really John Locke who forwarded this thought, was that any action in history will have unintended consequences because everything is connected, or as you always say, Indy. History does history. not happen in a vacuum. That is right. We need, and, we need coffee and, mugs. We need T-shirts and coffee <laughs> mugs. Oh, yeah, we're going to come uh, out with those pretty soon, actually, Indy. Uh, so, oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so, you know, you have an event and then it's more like chaos theory than uh, a kind of logical progression of events that comes from it. And I think that's been proven over and over again, especially in modern times when history shifts so fast. I mean, simply because technology moves as faster, information moves faster and whatnot. And we can see it definitely in, in World War II. I mean, you know, it was definitely not Hitler's uh, intention to bring about the most democratic time in human history so far. It was quite the contrary. But what he did no, had yeah, exactly okay. that effect, right? And yeah, yeah. yeah. So well, you know, if a lot we're of gonna, chaos there. If we're going to start talking about unintended consequences of World War II and Hitler's maybe unintended consequences. And uh, brings us to another lovely question from one of our lovely patrons. This one's coming from Peaceful Conquest. And he's asking, or they are asking, I should say, uh, to what extent do you think or consider the Bengal famine to be the result of malice? To what extent do you consider it to be the result of incompetence? And to what extent other factors? And also, just before you answer that, I would like to apologize to Robert Jarman, because Robert Jarman did not ask this last previous question it was just another Robert, who I checked on Patreon, does not have any last name. He's just called Robert. So that's why I said another question from Robert. Excuse me. Okay, all I got from that is that my next band is going to be called Hitler's Unintended Consequences. Okay? <laughs> that's what I got. Great band name. Great band Party, name. Do you want to start this one? Or Yeah, sure. I mean, I'm, I'm uh, right at the beginning of covering the Bengal famine. Hasn't really started yet, but the... First stages of it have begun in my War Against Humanity series. If you follow that, you'll know that. Um, I think it's a bit difficult when we're talking about things like that to put it into black and white, uh, like malice or or not. Um, but I, I just want to say, I want to just, just give it to jump in. I do not believe that to the greater extent it was caused by intentional malice. I do not believe that. It was already no, so I, much. that's why I think it's dangerous to, to use that word even because malice implies intent. Um, and it's always a fine line between negligence and intent. Um, I know the story fairly well of what happened. It was definitely negligence. Um, there's no question. They could have done many things. The 1941 famine never happened, even if the 1941 natural circumstances were exactly the same. Of course, in 1941, compared to 1943, the war had not yet impacted uh, the Indian subcontinent. Um, a large part of the famine had to do with the stop of rice imports from uh, other parts of Asia, namely Malaysia and, and uh, not Malaysia, Burma. Burma, um, yeah. And, and also because of the disruption of the uh, of any kind of shipment due to the naval war. So that was one thing. But there were also some really dumb economic decisions taken by the British administration in India, like allowing the price of rice to float freely. And then there was, of course, also the interests of the war effort and, you know, putting more rice at the end of the day towards feeding the armies than helping the people in need. Um, well, wait, it, it I wasn't think an just, area that, I mean, that's really difficult. And, and I think that it's interesting to hear your viewpoint there, Indy. And that's how we deal with this in 2022. Because obviously, there's no question. We're talking about colonialism. There's racism involved. And I think we can see, 
you know, we can either see things through that lens of 2022, or we can see it from the lens of 1943. And that's a really difficult, difficult task for anyone trying to understand history. That's, hmm, and, ask, yeah, and asking me to do it. Um, no, it's funny. I was going to jump in a minute ago. I was thinking, you got to realize that the, the, the Bengal, the, the, the whole province um, was mostly, you know, it's like three quarters of what was grown was rice and mostly was subsistence. A few months of feasting, a few months of living fine and two or three months of starving or near starving every year. And it's not just you know, the lacking the import of rice from Burma, that's big, but you have hundreds of thousands of soldiers of British and American and Canadian and Australian suddenly there and they need feeding and people are being taken from their farms and people are being paid in money instead of rice, whereas people were being paid in rice. And they did manage to ameliorate that when they opened up new lands for farming. They eliminated the Interprovincial trade barriers and stuff, um, but it was you know, it was too late. I mean, you, it was in the millions. The death toll was the low millions, but still. And what do I think that about? We don't have a famine like that right now. We don't. Um, we do food service to famines. We do major, major food drops. Um, I'm not really certain what you're asking me, Sparty. Um, well, no. I mean, I think that that was smarts for a lot of people in India is that this is part and parcel to colonialism. And it's also been something that's uh, been dif difficult to to debate in, in Great Britain over the last decades. And still to this day, it's, it's a difficult discussion because there is a definite element of racism in it. But Oh, sure. Yeah, I, sure. Yeah. And, and, and what I meant is that it, it I think it becomes almost more difficult to understand then malice or intent from a 2022 viewpoint uh, because the malice and intent at the time, it was sort of almost, it was almost considered obvious that it was okay to do that, which of course it isn't. And it wasn't even at the time. And that makes it all the more difficult to understand the idea of guilt. And, and when it comes down to it, that's why we don't deal with guilt inside of our shows. We talk about what happened. We don't talk about whose fault it was because that kind of comes by itself. If you line up the events of the Bengal famine, it is clear that Winston Churchill had a role in that which doesn't make him look good. But I don't need to tell you that. I don't need to sit in my, sh my show and condemn one person or the other. We don't even do that with Hitler. I mean, Hit Indy never says the evil man in Bertha's garden, right? I mean, that, that doesn't happen. And I think we discussed that from the beginning when we started doing the shows as well, why we don't want to do that. Well, we, we should also have a, have, a, have a mug or a T-shirt that says, if you need me to tell you Hitler was a bad guy, I'm not doing my job well. So, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know. The it, events should speak for themselves. Exactly. And if you if you examine the Bengal famine, it's clear the British don't look very good. You don't need me to tell you that because you just have to listen to what I'm saying. And obviously, everything in the world, except maybe Hitler, has dark sides and light sides. And, you know, there's always a little bit of this, a little bit of that. I think what's really important is that no matter who was at fault, no matter what the guilt is, we need to learn to not do these things again. And I think Indy made a good point there. When famines break out today, we're still not very good at handling them, but we have grown a lot better at it. And the Bengal famine, the Holodomor, and other events of the 20th century were the events that taught us how to do that, or at least taught us how important it is to do it, because if we don't do it, millions are going to die. Yeah. Well, you know, we're and talking about this Bengal famine. We're talking about the British colonialism in India. <clears throat> Indy, didn't you mention once to me this story about all sorts of whacked up British colonial policies? I mean, something about bounties for cobras. Can oh, I, I mean, well, along. Well, okay, no, I see. Like, um, like with something that was 
that happened that was unintended, unintentional. Oh, yes. You know, some, not, some type not of... without malice or anything. Yeah, no. I got, okay, I, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, this was last summer, sure. Um, oh, the Cobra Effect, right? Which is another great name for a band. And their album should be what you just said the, a few minutes ago, Everything in the World Except Maybe Hitler is the name of their, the Cobra Effect's first album. But the Cobra Effect is something from the British Raj. This is important. It has to do with unintended consequences. Um, <clears throat> there was a problem with too many cobras in Delhi, and too many cobras in the city. And, you know, people die from cobras because they're cobras. So uh, the British Raj decided to put a bounty on cobras. So, you know, to get rid of the cobras. Well, this worked for a little while, but then enterprising souls realized, you know what? We could breed cobras. And so they started breeding cobras and then bringing in cobras to collect the bounty. And then the, 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 the British realized, okay, well, that's not good. So they canceled the bounty thing because it wasn't having the right effect. But now you have all these cobra farmers that have lots of cobras and nobody wants to buy cobras as a general rule. So they let them go. And so the consequence was the even bigger cobra problem than they had had before. And that's called the Cobra Effect. Now, Hanoi, can I keep going? Is that cool? Yeah, sure. Go ahead, Indy. We're listening to with <laughs> okay. bated breaths. Hanoi. <laughs> okay, Hanoi had a similar situation with rats, actually, right? Um, Hanoi had too many rats. And, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Um, whoa. Let me it, stop you there, Indy. The solution to this problem is at hand. The staple food of cobras is rats. <laughs> Okay, yeah, but Hanoi and, and, and Delhi didn't get together and say, hey, although that would have been pretty cool. That would have been a great cooperation to ease the cobra effect. But the Hanoi rat effect. Except maybe, maybe then Hanoi would have just inherited the cobra problem <laughs> because rats well, normally don't, the rats don't really have a good chance against cobras. <laughs> but the uh, rats do breed well. And to prove that you had killed a rat and got the bounty, you had to bring in a tail from the rat. And this worked for a little while until the government started finding that there were a bunch of tailless rats running around town. Because you could sell, get the tail and get the bounty, but then the tailless rat, well, it can still produce new rats. and They have tails. And they produce rats quite quickly. So that also was similar. Uh, we have a modern version of the Cobra effect, and that's the Streisand effect, the Barbara Streisand effect. Do you guys know this? Yeah, I've heard of that one. It's fairly well known. Yeah, okay. Well known. It, it has to do with coastal erosion. Uh, California coastal erosion, um, like nearly 20 years ago, a guy did like 12,000 aerial photos of the California coast to document coastal erosion. One of these photos happens to have Barbara Streisand's mansion in it. And Streisand sued these guys because of that. And she sued them for a lot of money, like millions of dollars. Now, here's the thing. It wasn't called the photo with Barbara Streisand's mansion. It was called, called like photo 3850 or something like that. I think it was 3850. Um, before the trial, exactly six people had downloaded photo 3850 and two of them were Streisand's lawyers, right? Once the trial started, 400,000 people in the next month downloaded the photo of Barbara Streisand's mansion and knew, of course, exactly where it was. So that's the modern version of the Cobra effect. Um, as long as I'm on a roll, and I'll turn, I'll turn, turn the mic over to you guys in, in, in a minute, and you can start doing '80s rap, like you know, boom, <laughs> beep, bum, bum, da hido, bam. If I did that, Andy, that would be the. If I did that, Indy, that'd be the end of our show. <laughs> okay, you know cool. that, I had a, but I, had a I have a personal story. In high school, so I can try my best, but I have a personal story of unintended consequences. We should have at least one personal story here. Okay, this happens. This has to do with lawnmowers, Pepsi, and the death of Elvis and my life. You ready? Oh, go for it, Indy. Okay. Now, when I was a little boy, and I mean like nine years old, nine, ten years old, I was fascinated with the lawnmower. I would watch dad mow the lawn and stuff. I thought lawnmower is so cool. I can't wait. Can't wait until I'm old enough to mow the lawn. I'd always pester him, telling him, I'm old enough to mow the lawn. He's like, just nine years old, not old enough to mow the lawn. 
but it was the 70s. And one day, he didn't feel like mowing the lawn, and the pestering got to him. He's like, do you really know how to run the lawnmower? And I'm like, yeah, sure. I showed him that I knew how to turn it off. I knew how to put it in gear. I knew how to take the leaf catcher. I knew how to empty that in the garbage bag. I, I wasn't strong enough to start the mower, but that's like, okay, well, um, sure. And he started the mower for me, and he's like, just, you know, when you need it started again after you, you know, empty the leaves and stuff, just come and get me. Nine years old, heavy machinery was placed in my hands with a big swirling blade. That was the 70s. Sparty, you grew up then, right? Oh, I totally, I remember, I remember the whole thing. I remember that turning wheel as well. It looks pretty much the same still today, you know, the mower. Okay, so yeah. I mow the lawn. I start mowing the lawn and I've mowed like half of our lawn. We lived on a corner, so we had a big lawn. And I decided, oh, I turned it off, I emptied the leaves. I'm like, I'm gonna go get a, get a soft drink. So we're on the corner to the drugstore, Eckerd Drugs. And now I stood in front of the soft drinks and I was gonna get a Coke. Here, and this is something very, very Southern in the States. Anybody, any of you out there from the South will understand this. Um, like I never ate at a McDonald's till I was like 16. Not because I had anything against McDonald's. I didn't think they were bad or anything, but my family ate at Burger King. So if I wanted a hamburger, I would eat a burger. It wouldn't cross my mind to eat at McDonald's. Also, we drank Coca-Cola. It had never crossed my mind to have a Pepsi. I'd never drunk a Pepsi, but I was standing there at my mowing the lawn, nine years old, and uh, I thought, and I bought a can of Pepsi. And I went back and I was sitting on the front step of our house drinking my Pepsi, gearing up to mow the second half of the lawn, and the radio announced that Elvis Presley had just died. And I ran in the house, <clears throat> ran in the house. I told my mom, 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 Elvis Presley just died. And my mom started crying, and my mom never cries. And I went slowly back outside, realizing what I had done. I had just killed Elvis Presley by drinking a Pepsi. Oh, yeah. And now I've tried to do it to Bono several times, but it has never worked. I think it was like a one-time <laughs> talent, you know? Uh, you know that on that day when you were mowing the lawn in, in <clears throat> Houston, um, I was in London, actually. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I was very confused why everybody was so upset about Elvis dying because I'd been indoctrinated by my very conservative parents that Elvis was not good, not good. He was a oh my we 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 were we were from the from the south, man. Elvis was Elvis was as important as Jesus to most people. Yeah, I know, well, and I realized that Jewish people. I realized that on that day, I mean, you know, uh, suddenly within minutes for like a, a nine-year-old, that's a very strange kind of thing to experience. Uh, you know, seeing how suddenly a whole city goes into mourning more or less in at once. And I, I didn't understand it. It was way beyond me. I couldn't get it. Yeah. I, I think I think I've seen my mom cry like five times in my whole life. And one of them was when I told her that Elvis died. That's um. That was a big, and I, it was my fault. Yeah, I, she was I, crying because it, it was your fault. World. It was my no. She wasn't. I didn't tell mom that I drank a Pepsi. Are you crazy? Yeah, and all of those people in London that I witnessed. It was you, Indy. You did it. It was me. It was actually, you know, unintended consequences. Mentioning Bono, I think definitely my favorite, my favorite moment in YouTube his, you, YouTube U two history was in the early nineties. When um, they were playing in Glasgow, U2 was playing in Glasgow, and this classic, and it's on videotape, it's on film, and Bono like gets the crowd to start doing this, just like this, just like that, and after like three or four of them, and you know, fifty thousand people clapping, he says, "Every time I clap my hands, a child in Africa dies," and you hear this voice going, "Well, stop fucking doing it then." <laughs> <laughs> Which oh, the cynicism. You, you, you the could cynicism never make that cult. up. That you could never make that up. That's the kind of thing that, you know, that's, that's, it's a wonderful world we live in sometimes. Um, All right. Well, you know, if we're, we're getting not. to kind of fun anecdotes and, you know, toward the end of a show, we've actually got a few fun questions coming in from the patron community. Time goes to army. Okay. Um, actually, this one comes from Dixon Fua. Dixon is one of our most loyal commenters. I feel like I know you sure. on a personal level. I think we all do, actually. So big hello to Dixon yeah, yeah. from all of us. 
Um, and Howdy. he's asking, have Indy or any of the team ever visited Singapore or Southeast Asia before? I'm from Singapore here, so just curious on my end. Oh, um, I, I've actually uh, never been to Southeast Asia. The closest I've been, I've only been to Asia uh, by being in the Asian part of Turkey, as a matter of fact. It's one of my, like, big, it's, it's, a, it's a shame, and I need to change it. I wanted to change it, but then Corona happened. I too have never been in Southeast Asia, um, and I too the first the furthest Asian I've been has been uh, the has been in Eastern Turkey. Um, you know that's that's funny that neither of us has been there because we do both travel. I mean, a fair I've, I've been in I mean, Arabia, I've been in Africa, and South America. I mean, I've been I in Saudi say- Arabia and and in uh, in Dubai and stuff, but I mean that's further west to some degree. Dixon, I can say it's not quite Singapore, but I have been to. I don't know if you'd call it Southeast, certainly an East Asian uh, city state, or maybe just a city of the People's Republic of China, depending who's listening to me. But uh, Hong Kong, I visited and I fell in love with it. And I saw Shenzhen at the same time. And I'd really like to go to Southeast Asia sometime this year, maybe, if this podcast takes off and uh, these two give me a raise. So. Oh, yeah, that's going to happen. Totally, man. Plan your trip now. Yeah. Woo. <laughs> but I've, actually, but I, I'd I've like, already bought I, a flight I, on a credit card, so I, I've oh, been meaning great. to talk Thanks. to you guys I'll tell about Astrid. That. She'll she'll love you for it. It was on but, a company uh, card. Uh, Dixon. Yeah, it's great. I mean, Astrid will be delighted. But but Dixon, I, I really, I mean, I'd like to join in in thanking you for uh, being a frequent, frequent commenter, but also giving us insight into the Asian theaters of the war. Um which is, you know, one of the most difficult things we have to do. I think, you know, you struggle with it on the war front and I struggle with it on the war crimes front. And it's always it's pretty tricky to, it's to not cover so much the... Just, yeah. Well, it's not so much just the Asian theater. It's really China. Um, you know, I, I maybe you guys will remember uh, I, in the fall of, I think, 1940... In October 1940, there was a small, a minor battle in China that I covered that it was small enough that I could have, you know, hopped over it for the rest of that offensive. But I covered it because I had three different sources about it. One of them was from the Chinese communists, one of the Chinese nationalists, one was the Japanese source. And there are three completely different stories. Um, Two of them, the Chinese one, and one of those sources was the Japanese source. But the communist Chinese, and they had different death totals, different people were there. Um, and that's the major problem, you know, people ask about. The, I have a hard time covering the war in China. Um, we had something, though, just last week, just maybe just a few days ago, actually, four or five days ago, um, that was not about the war in China, but was that was a similar thing, but it has to do with the Americans. And you would think that they kept the records and stuff, and there wouldn't be that oh, did this happen or did that happen or did he sign that? But there really was, and it's something major. It has to do with the death of Yamamoto, right? Um, A lot of sources say that when the intelligence came over, that they knew where Yamamoto's plane was going to be and, you know, should we kill him, should we not kill him, the decision was made by President Roosevelt and and, uh, Secretary of the Navy Frank Knox and then sent back down to Chester Nimitz and him and Bull Halsey organized it, yada, yada, yada. Some guy wrote in, though, very angry, saying Nimitz made the decision by himself. Uh, he didn't involve anyone and stuff, and he was angry. And I did a, I looked at a bunch more sources, and my honest, honest, honest response now about that is, I don't know. Um, Edwin Layton, who who tried, who got the intelligence, yeah, he gave it to Nimitz, and Layton did report at one point. He said, no, Nimitz made the decision by himself. Fine. But in his memoirs, Leighton said, no, 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 no. He, he got, he'd gotten the go-ahead from Washington. Okay. And Nimitz, of course, always gave copies of his important orders to his superior, uh, Ernest King, right? Chief of Oper- Naval Operations. But there's no record that King ever knew anything about this at all. And that doesn't make sense. It's, it's, it, the more you dig into it, the less you know. If I, I, I'm about, I'll say, I'll say right now I'm about 65 35, with 65 being that Nimitz just made the call himself 
and 35 being that it was FDR, Knox, and uh, uh, Army Air Force Chief Hap Arnold. Because one of the pilots that actually took place in the mission, he said his orders were signed Knox. And you're like, well, that sounds like his order, you know, that's, pr but wait a second, this was an Army Air Force pilot. Why would Knox not only bypass Nimitz, why would he be issuing orders to a squadron of Army Air Force after, so, we still see that. We saw that in the Great War with the Falkenhayn controversy. I know I, I'm, I know I'm babbling, but let me let me continue for a sec here, Ian. Okay. Um, yeah, but wait, wait, wait. Before you leave the whole the leave the the decision uh, for Operation Vengeance, I mean, you yeah. know, let's assume that FDR was not involved in that decision, which is possible, I guess. Um, that means that they took a decision that would have impact for all the United Nations allied countries because the biggest fear i mean we just did an episode about this that we just recorded today actually that austria did about spies and ties as well, uh, spies and ties uh the biggest fear they had was that if they go ahead and kill yamamoto then the japanese will work out that they have cracked the codes and right. uh <laughs> not completely unexpectedly, Churchill blew a gasket when he found out that they had done this based on having cracked the JN25D code. Uh, and uh, he was furious. So let's assume that it was Knox, or not even, it was Nimitz who took the decision without consulting FDR at all. They actually risked creating a inter-allied conflict and a global problem that could have led to catastrophic consequences for the war. They were very clever, though, so they avoided it by pretending that it was just sure. a chance thing. You should watch the episode that Astrid did to see the details of that. But, I mean, it, it's quite, you know, it, it sounds, and that's what's so interesting with these con controversies, it sounds like such a such an unimportant thing, whoever took that decision. But it isn't, because if we could understand exactly who did take the decision, then we understand much more about the inter-allied relationships and what was going on within the Allied command. It's true. I will likely know more this summer when I, you know, because I'm, I'm writing... Uh, June and July 1943 right now as we're doing this. Well, not as we're doing this. I did it earlier today. I'm not that good at multitasking that I can write the war and talk to all of you guys about Elvis, Lawnmowers, and Elon Musk, which is a bad name for an album. But um, this summer, I hopefully I'll be reading more of Churchill and FDR's correspondence, and they're going to meet together in Canada. Um, I'd like to find out if there was any discussion that's actually recorded between them on the subject, you know? But it, it's funny that even beyond China, even the United States has the same problem that we still, we don't actually know 100% which happened either way. Yeah, we get the question often, you know, a lot of questions about current affairs. And my standard answer to that is we don't do current affairs because it's a different kind of research. That's investigative journalism, and we deal with looking into the records that we have found. But I mean, that answer is, in view of what you just related, Indy, not correct, because a large portion of history studies is actually unearthing those uh, those files, those documents, those records that tell us what happened. And that's not always possible. So it, it, it's detective work that sometimes just leads nowhere. And guys, I'm, I'm well, going to pull the back. brakes over here okay. if I can. Go ahead, Andy. pull the brakes. All right, all right, because we are getting close to the end of a show, and there is actually something that I think people are a lot more interested in than historiography, and that's Party's daughter, Anna, actually. And we have Wait, 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 wait. Nobody's more, nobody's more interested in anything than historiography. I, I think okay. Indy's right. historiography... And then Anna's like number two, and then maybe ancient Greek battle helmets, maybe. And then like Max from Heart to Heart is like number four. Those are like the four things people are most interested well, in. Well, I might, okay. I might for personal reasons disagree with you, but if we're talking about anybody else's daughter, yeah, you're right. Yes. Um, you know, and the reason I mentioned this is because one of the questions that came in was, is Anna single and can I have her number? And I'm not actually even going to read the person's name who said ah. that. And, you know, uh, and Anna's not here, so I don't want to, you know, start talking on her behalf at all. 
But it is an interesting point, which is that, you know, doing YouTube and having in total millions of people who have seen these videos and Anna's most recent video got one and a half million views. And, you know, you get creepy and weird people. I'm not saying this guy's creepy or weird, but in general, you get a lot of comments that are romantic or flirtatious <laughs> or commenting on your looks. And I know, you know, these two gentlemen over here have certainly experienced it. Uh, and the few times that, you know, some of our editors on the team who are women have come on, they've certainly gotten a few comments too, and people adding them on Instagram and finding their Facebook. And I guess I just want to ask, you know, both of you, what's it kind of like being on YouTube and having a lot of your life? I thought you wanted to ask Sparty about Anna. <laughs> I'm going to answer the question first. And the answer is, well, you're going to have to ask her if she's single. I'm not going to tell you. And I'm her dad. So if you're asking for her number, no, you cannot have it. <laughs> but oh, but she, wait, wait, wait. I have to tell you guys something. Um, but wait, uh, and before you Anna take this, before you take this in a different direction, I have to point yeah. out because I, I feel sorry for the guy who asked this question. He was making a joke. And there's no, nothing I, creepy. Yeah, yeah. About I appreciate that. It's, 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 it's a jumping it's all off fine. point. It's all fine. It's a jumping off point for maybe a broader discussion on what it could be like sometimes to get all sorts of YouTube. But wait, comments. but Ian, I'm not done with this question yet. Okay. Since Anna was 12, and she still calls me this today. Um, she calls me her American boyfriend and I call her my German girlfriend. There's a reason for this. When she was 12 was when I first met Astrid and started, I knew Sparty before, but came down, kept coming down from Sweden and started working with them and stuff. And, you know, I didn't speak German and I, I know she was 12. She didn't speak English, but you know, we got along. Okay. She was a kid, you know? And one day Astrid and Sparty had to do something and they said, Hey, can you, um, just take Anna to like for like dinner to the pizzeria in, in, in Tootsing and you know just I'm like yeah sure so we hung out for a couple hours we had pizza she had a coke I had beer we it was entertaining because we were using a lot of mime and stuff and trying to figure out words and things like that you know fun taking care of like a kid right well next day Astrid comes up to me and she's got like this ho 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 ho, ho look on her face I'm like what she goes well you know Anna's been walking around school today telling people that her American boyfriend took her out yesterday for pizza and stuff. And he's a little bit of an older man. And I'm like, I'm going to get arrested if you tell people things like that. But she, um, yeah, she, Anna's the closest thing to a daughter that I have after all these years. And I don't have any kids of my own. And I know. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, but she's my, she's my German girlfriend and I'm her American boyfriend and that's the way it's going to be until we die, even though I'm getting married in July, not to Anna. That's right. But, but to answer your question, Ian, I think, you know, um, that's a complicated issue. I think it has really changed very much in the last few years. I mean, about 50, uh, 55 years ago, uh, um, Andy Warhol stipulated that everybody was going to have their 15 minutes of fame because he foresaw what has happened, which is the explosion of media to the point of that everybody is a media creator. Um, but, you know, obviously, if you do stuff that comes out to a large amount of people and, and you generate a bigger following, that kind of changes. Um and of course, it means something for us all. But I, I mean, at the end of the day, it really comes down to trying to see, see, see it for what it is, and and that is that we're living in a you know huge change, and it influences everything that we do, not just those of us who have chosen to go into the public eye and stand on a stage and actually expose ourselves to it. But everyone today is to some degree exposed through what they post online. And we develop a public persona that might be different from the one that we have at home. It might be the same. You know, that's that's a choice we make. But at the end of the day, all of these questions that are kind of laser focused on those of us who are standing in front of the camera or being, you know, known to a greater amount of people than others, they apply to everyone today. And and I think that, you know, to kind of give you my two cents about it, just try to be more decent to each other in general. Um, and I mean, I'm not saying that I'm the most decent person in the world. I'm guilty of the same. I sometimes, you know, get 
<clears throat> hot and bothered in, in the comment sections and stuff like that. We all do. But I really think that we have to change the way we deal with each other in the public eye. Not just people who are known, but everyone. And it's decency. That That's really what it comes down to. And it's not so easy. But, you know, we're a, we're a work in progress, humanity, as they say. I think on that note, we're going to wrap this up, right? That was a nice little speech, Farty. Well done. I think it's a very nice speech. It brings us exactly to an hour. And I was very happy speaking with both of you today. It was my pleasure. Okay, well, let's say our three names again, and then and then then we'll all say oh, Excelsior. And, and we got again, we okay? got another question from Robert Jarman. Speaking of names, which is what is the name of his dog? And I assume we're talking about um, Sparty's dogs. So we'll we'll say their names too. Yeah, there are two actually. Uh, Argos is the he. He's the big big uh, good boy, and uh, the big good girl is uh, Cleo, short for Cleopatra. Okay, so can we do the names thing now? Let's yeah. do the names thing. <laughs> well, I'm Ian Souden. Thank Excelsior. you all for tuning in. Damn it, I was going to lead. Okay, then I'll go last. Sparty, you go second. Oh, I wanted to go last. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Okay, I got this. I'm Indy Nidell. That's a hard one to follow on. I'm Spartacus Olsen, and this has been a Time Ghost podcast. Excelsior! Excelsior! <laughs> All right. See you We're guys so next time. bad at this. Cool. We need See to you next Thursday, everybody. Guys. This can be warts in all part. Okay. <laughs> Bye, everybody.